I'd like to welcome Peter Navarro. Peter, thanks for joining me this morning. And thanks to Carl for calling me special in some way. But uh, hey, great to see you in uh, virtual space here, Rick. Exactly. Listen, let's start at the very beginning, Peter, okay? We have some time here. The last I looked, the month-over-month -month trade deficit was f close to $57 billion. That is the highest month-over-month -month level since October of 2008. Many do not agree with the way you frame the issue that we need to address unfair practices in trade by targeting some of the dollar amounts in trade deficits. Why is your opinion on that different than other economists? Sure. Uh, the, w the way I look at uh, trade deficits is, is it's a reverse mortgage, essentially, that the American people are, are taking out. They send, we, you know, we buy our stuff, we send the money to China or to Europe or wherever it is. And what happens is that money comes back, not in the form necessarily of investing in our factories, but rather just buying up our assets. And over time, there's a problem that Warren Buffett has actually called conquest by purchase. So that if we do as we're doing, which is to run a trade deficit of about a half a trillion dollars a year, year over year, that adds up to trillions and trillions of dollars in the hands of foreigners that they use to buy up America and American factories, American real estate, and things like that. And that's just not good for America. It's not good for national security, not good for economic security. So that's, that's uh, the, uh, and the president understands that we cannot continue to run this reverse mortgage situation. So we go into a situation where what are we going to do about it? Now, Rick, you and I both know. No, wait, but let me stop you right there, sure. Peter. Peter, let me stop you a minute. Sure. I agree with everything you said there, but let me hit a couple asterisks. Uh, many of these countries, though, use some of that money to buy our debt. And there has been many periods of time in the past post-crisis where that was very important, especially now when we consider sure. uh, what the ramifications may be if there's less money in those hands. Your thoughts just on that slant on it. Sure, and, and what you say is kind of the bright side of the picture, but the dark side is that many of those countries also buy our paper so that they can undervalue their currency, which in turn allows them to sell us exports cheaper, makes it harder for us to sell exports to them and exacerbates our trade deficits. So it's a complex question, but at the end of the day, um, we have trade deficits with every single major trading partner we have. The biggest one's China, $370 billion in trade uh, in, in 2017. Europe, it's $150 billion. Now, Rick, let me tell you this. For every billion dollars of trade deficit we have, according to some estimates, that's 6,000 jobs we lose. We're essentially shipping our factories over there. So the European deficit alone is over a million jobs we don't have in America here. And that's another reason why these trade deficits really aren't working for the American people. All right, now, now that's a perfect segue into my next issue. Sure. Now, in my opinion, people are making this in the media that we are already in a hot trade war. Like the Cold War that we had after World War II, I look at it more as a cold issue with, with regard to tariffs. But what worries me is, I agree with your numbers, but to resolve that issue is what I'm thinking about. That if we take a certain path, do we provoke activity that would negate sure. some of those positives, or do you think it could be done in a way that won't turn into a warm or hot trade war? I think that we can obviously do it in a way that can be good for the American people and good for the global trading system. And let me work you through that a little bit. If you think about it, we have the lowest tariffs in the world uh, amongst our major trading partners. And that's simply unfair. If China exports a car here to the U.S., they pay a tariff of 2.5 percent. No, wait, GM Peter, this isn't yeah. only China either. This is China, Europe, sure. Japan. They all have these WTO yeah. strange vats let's, uh, on imports, let's take, let's take Japan. They send us 100 cars for every one we send to them, and that's a problem of non-tariff barriers. So the point here, Rick, is that tariffs basically, first of all, they provide a defensive measure to level the playing field in a time when, when we are defenseless against this because we are such free traders and have signed on to the world trading system. So, but they also, look, let's look at what's happened since the president has put tariffs on, courageously, I might add. Solar and washers in January, what have we had? We've had a tremendous influx of investment so that we'll be building washing machines here in America with that foreign investment 
using American hands. And when we did the steel and aluminum tariffs, guess what, Rick? The first day when those things were signed, Century Aluminum, Hawesville, Kentucky, announced a $100 million investment to modernize and expand its plant. And U.S. Steel announced the opening of a facility in Granite City, Illinois, that's been shut down. So this is the reason why tariffs can be good and defensive for the American people. And President Trump, I mean, it's courageous what he's doing because he takes all sorts of heat from the swamp, the usual suspects. But if you look at it clinically, we can do this in a way that is peaceful and will improve and strengthen the trading system because right and now it's not fair. that's the crux of this matter, Peter. That yeah. is, you, Rick. You're I right totally agree Listen, with you. I don't think anybody I talk w with would disagree that between tariffs, VATs, import sure. VATs, all the issues of China, Europe, and Japan, we're not getting a great deal. But right. the adaption of the globalization of economies has made it so tinkering can have outsized consequences and I guess that's what most people the unknown are nervous about sure. now I know Larry Kudlow joined no, the me, party can here can I just uh, and, I'll, I'll and, talk okay go on go let, on let me just say one thing we come in peace here the, the thing everybody on Wall Street needs to understand is just just relax if you look at the negotiating posture of this country all these countries that are running huge trade surpluses with us have no incentive to rock that boat all we're doing is standing up. Now let's talk about Larry, because he, he's, you know, this is our, I think this is probably our 15 year reunion here, because he and I go back to your network, CNBC. I was on his show frequently. I, I, was, I worked at CNBC for many years. I find him to be a smart, warm individual. He's going to come here and be a team player. Uh, and it's going to be great. The president, President Trump, in order to make the best decisions possible, I've seen this in the Oval, I've seen it in the Roosevelt Room, he needs diverse opinions. And it, it, it's, I think it's a great choice, and everybody here is going to welcome him with open arms, and, and we're looking uh, forward, not backward. Uh, that's, and my final topic, you know, I remember a day, Peter, where the big news is China was welcomed into world trade was that the goal was yeah. to make China more of a consumption economy and make the U.S. a bit more of an export economy. Now, it doesn't seem like I hear much of that anymore, but embedded in that very basic principle seems to be uh, the direction that you would like to see things move. Is that correctly framed the issue? That, that does, Rick. And uh, China entering the WTO in 2001 was a fundamental shock, not just the United States, but, but to Europe and the rest of the world, because China came in basically saying that they play by the rules. And since that time, they've basically broken every rule in the book. And basically, they've destabilized the world trading system. So, for example, in the coming uh, weeks, uh, President Trump is going to have on his desk some recommendations on Ambassador Robert Lighthizer's, quote, 301 investigation of China's theft and forced transfer or intellectual property. This will be one of the steps, one of the many steps the president is courageously going to take in order to address unfair trade practices. And Rick, I don't think there's a single person uh, on the floor of the Wall Street, uh, you know, anybody on Wall Street, that will oppose cracking down on China's theft of her intellectual property. No, or and, their and that's transfer. the universal. Crazy. And that's universal. That's why I'm, I'm actually happy that you're there and Larry's there. Because the real that. issue here is trying to get a job done that needs to be done, and it's the right time, in my opinion, because the world economy is coming out and getting some tailwinds to address these issues. It's how we address them and how we frame it. And, and I guess my final question uh, or, or series of questions would revolve around the following. How do you think it will play out with regard to this adaption of these new rules? Are China, Europe, uh, Merkel, even uh, companies that import that are looking for exemptions, will they be able to navigate this without doing undue short-term damage to the economy? Well, I think the beauty of President Trump is he's firm but flexible. And, and this is what, what, uh, what's going to happen. And I want, look, if you think about the markets, which you look at every day, uh, this administration has cut taxes. It's it undergone tremendous deregulation. We've unleashed our energy sector. We are, are working hard to restructure the trading environment in a way which works 
not just for Americans, but also for the rest of the world. So it's going to be done in a measured, firm, but flexible way. And we're going to work with our allies and trading partners to make things better for everybody. And that's the direction we're trying to head. And I think it'll be fine if you just look at the chessboard, because Nobody really has any incentive to pick a fight with us. They're, they're getting too good a deal from us. All we're looking for is a better deal for the American people. No, and I get that, but the only problem I keep coming back to, Peter, sure. and I agree with you on the major point, is that every dollar we gain on a renegotiated deal is going to come out of one of these economies' pockets. And even if it's in their pocket unfairly, that transition is going to take some getting used to. So I'll ask you this. Sure. They've always said the stock market's a forward pricing mechanism. It, 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 let me ask you one question, yes or no. Is what you're doing going to be really good for the long-term U.S. economy? It's going to be great, not just for the long uh, American economy, but for the rest of the world. I don't see this, Rick, as okay, you framed it as a zero-sum game. Let me, let me game. continue. I don't see if, it if as a it's zero good, game. If it's good for us and it's good for the global economy, then what you're really saying is if you're a stock investor watching this right now, and you see uncertainty playing out, it's going a bit sideways here, that this could be, in your opinion, an opportunity because ultimately this uncertainty leads to a better set of outcomes. Is, sure, let's think about it. Do you agree with that? I, I totally agree because let's, let's face it, if we're stronger, if we're hitting our 3% GDP growth rate benchmark every year, what, what, what's in it for the rest of the world? Well, we buy more of their stuff and we're able to fund our defense budget so that when Japan needs us basically in the East China Sea or when Europe needs us uh, for NATO purposes, we'll be strong. President Trump, one of the most important things he said in office is that economic security is national security. And when we have both, the world is safer and more prosperous. And you know, on that final thought, I want to ask you another question. When I hear our allies, allies like Europe, like Japan say, you know, why would you put tariffs on us? Why would you question our activity on fairness? We're your allies. Am I wrong to differentiate that from a defense standpoint, there are allies, but aren't we in a very soft economic war right now, even with our allies? Am I overstating that? Yes, uh, let's not use the W word. I mean, basically what we're in now is... No, but you is, know is what it, I mean, okay? I know exactly what you mean, but let, okay. let's look at that relationship so, so we understand each other. Basically, we're in a situation with the rest of the world where the trading playing field is highly tilted in their direction. Because of that, we are having trouble historically growing the way we should, and when we don't grow, we don't have the money to help defend them. So. Uh, the allies can't bring the idea of strategy into economics without understanding our core principle. Economic security is national security, not just for us, but for them as well. So, I, you know, look, there's going to be posturing and public pronouncement, whatever. But at the end of the day, behind closed doors, through diplomacy and everybody, everything else, our allies are going to understand that we're simply defending ourselves against what's been really an unfair relationship for many, many years, and it, it, this is going to work out fine. Uh, the world's going to be a better place. The trading system, All right, so this is now important, let's, will They're be giving more us stable. more time. Let's talk about the logistics of the rollout. You know, I'm a logistics guy. I like talking about things I can touch. So there's <laughs> going to be companies calling. domestically, <laughs> domestically you be running, that import. Running there's running be an aircraft <laughs> carrier is what I mean. <laughs> Go ahead. There's going to be countries exporting. They're going to want exemptions, exceptions, and carve-outs. Uh, and I know, based on some of the recent headlines, uh, and you tell me if you feel differently, that we're going to probably pass a few of those out. Will that procedure be Trump-like? In other words, no red tape, it's not going to take forever, it's not going to be bureaucratic, that we're going to have an efficient way to implement, especially the carve-outs, exceptions, and exemptions. So uh, we're blessed with having uh, Ambassador Robert Lighthizer and Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross. Uh, they're working as we speak to make sure that this moves in what I like to call Trump time, uh, not, in, not in the government bureaucracy time. And these carve-outs uh, and exemptions are going to be done in a way which is sensitive to the strength of our economy, but also make sure, remember, the steel and aluminum tariffs are being done for one reason and one reason alone, national security, to defend those industries as pillar industries. So whatever is done within the framework 
will also ensure that those industries maintain the staunchest defense. So this is Trump time, Rick. We do things different here. I think you've seen that. The first year, let's look, Rick, the first year of this presidency has been the, one of the best years oh, in economics I'm with of you. any, I'm with you. any Listen, president Peter, in history. This Peter, is, your, this is your history. boss is, is, is cut from a it's different amazing. mold. I get it. I get it. And maybe this is exactly the type of person this we need because these things aren't easy. The, the global economies and the global political environment has melded in such a way that it's very difficult to peel back the onion. A man like Trump, whether you like uh, his style or not, has the right style to peel an onion politically, globally, financially. Peter Navarro, thank you so much for being a good sport. Great pleasure Make to sure talk you with give you, Larry a big hug from me when you I see him do tonight. That. I will. And Carl, back to you. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.